So, the five pillars of extraordinary health. Anybody want to guess them? No, don't do it. Because some of them you're probably going to know, but we're going to reinforce some of the stuff that you, you already know. Uh, and then we're going to, go again, go over a lot of details with regards to all these different uh, these pillars. But the first one on the hit list is nutrition. I mean, how common is that one? you got to obviously eat better. Whenever anybody thinks about improving their health, they always think of two things, diet and exercise. Outside of that, you know, there's a lot more to do than just eating right and exercising and moving well. But one that's extremely important is nutrition. So we're going to go into some details here. Doesn't that look nice and healthy? Yes. yes. All right, these are what we call whole foods. So you have lots of bright colored fruits and vegetables. If you notice, not too many people grab some snacks, but what's over there in the snack tray? If you want to go up and grab some, by all means, you're not going to offend me. You can do it during the talk. That's fine. Um, nourish yourselves. Don't fall asleep on me. Get some food in there. So you want to eat really the rainbow of colors when it comes to fruits and vegetables. Yes, broccoli is great, but if you just eat broccoli, you're going to get a lot of these particular type of nutrients, but miss out on the whole spectrum. So really try and eat a variety of them. Lean meats, you have some eggs, there's some legumes up there, some nuts, some seeds, um, a whole bunch of different things that you can get, and those are all whole foods. What a lot of people seem to consume these days is column B. So, I know everybody knows the answer, not everybody does the right thing all the time, but if you had to choose a column, column A or column B, which would you say is the healthier column? Hey. Column A, exactly. So why do people come over here and eat that on a daily basis? I don't think there's a single person on the planet who if I asked that question, column A or column B, that would actually get it wrong. But we choose this one and sometimes it's taste and sometimes it's texture and sometimes it's convenience. Okay, I get it. You know, not everybody has time to sit home and cook all their meals all the time. Uh, but there's different ways you can do that that can help save time if time's an issue. But we're going to talk about some of the stuff here. So, you ideally want to have the high quality whole foods in your diet. These are the essential building blocks of your body. Fruits, <coughs> veggies, lean meats, legumes, assorted nuts, and seeds. Kind of like that, those first two pictures we just showed you. All right? Your body, it's almost magical. It literally has a magic trick. Every single day, there's a miracle that occurs. You take a turkey sandwich, and you eat a turkey <coughs> sandwich, and in less than 24 hours, your body completely breaks that turkey sandwich down, absorbs it into the, into the bloodstream, and now it turns the turkey sandwich into living, breathing cells. It's unbelievable. So that turkey sandwich now is a heart cell, or it's a, a lung cell, or it's a liver cell. We're gonna give you a cup of water. I do need it's, it's in the works, it's coming on down, and you just sit tight right there. Thank you. So it turns it into living, breathing cells. I mean, that's amazing. Oh, thank you. So, do you want to fill your body and rebuild your body with good quality whole foods? Or do you want to fill it with ramen noodles? Or do you want to fill it with potato chips? Or things like that. Because your body's going to take those potato chips and those ramen noodles and it's still going to do everything it can to try and rebuild itself. But you are what you eat. I mean, everybody knows that saying by now. So you can either be good quality things or you could be garbage. It's your choice. And unfortunately, a lot of people go the second route. You want to drop by organic whenever possible. Yes, I know, it can be a bit pricey, particularly when you start talking about your meats. So there's other options. You can go to your local farmer's markets. Your far I'm a big, big pusher of the whole farmer, farmer's market thing, especially, you know, buy local, support local. Uh, plus, they, they pretty much just pulled it out of the ground that morning. So, I mean, there's nothing better than just, you know, pulling something out of the ground and eating it almost as soon as, it, as, as soon as you're done with it. We actually have a garden. It's not a huge garden, but a number of reasons why. I love just getting out there with my kids and showing them that you can actually create life out of dirt, dirt, water, and seeds. It's pretty cool. But then when it finally comes time to harvest it, you, know, you guys want a salad today? Sure, all right, let's go out to the garden. You just hack off some lettuce, you throw it in a bowl, you obviously clean it up, and you just ate something within minutes of disconnecting it from the earth. There's just something really awesome about that. So there's ways around the organic label. If you don't want to try and grow your own stuff, go to your farmer's market because they're not going to have to put as much of the preservatives on it to transport it across the country and store it for a couple of weeks. All right, eliminate pesticides, preservatives, dyes, hormones, whatever. 
If you don't buy organic meats, it's really tough to get away from the hormones and the antibiotics um, because that's what processing does. They want to get the most bang for their buck. So they're going to they're gonna really inject those, those chickens and those, those cows with different growth hormones to try and make them larger and bigger. Uh, and they're going to want to you know, keep them in tight quarters so they need antibiotics to prevent infections. So it's really tough to get some good quality meats unless it's organic. Or talk to your local farmers and ask them how they do things. Typically, they're not going to be shoved in stalls where they can't move. They're going to be grass-fed most of the time, but maybe they'll have grains as well. So they might not be organic 100%, but they're going to be a lot better than the industrialized meats. So, oh, by the way, the preservatives, the dyes, uh, go check out last month's talk because we talk about some of those things and the uh, things that you want to absolutely avoid in processed foods. No artificial sweeteners. I'll say it again. No artificial sweeteners. You really want to stay away from artificial sweeteners as much as possible. Like your aspartame and your um, I'm blanking. Sucralose. Su Sucralose. Sucralose. Splenda. Thank you. That's the one I was looking for. You were all wrong. She got it right. I'm just kidding. So you want to stay away from your artificial sweeteners because they, they have no business being in your body. They're totally um, unnatural. So when you consume these things, there's a whole host of adverse side effects and problems that you can, you can get from those things. So really try and eliminate those as much as you can. There's some other alternative sweeteners you can use. It's in a couple different talks, but the one we did last month is a good one to check out. Stay away from fast food, fried foods, things like that. Do I even have to say that? You know, if I put up a picture of you grilling out on the barbecue at home and a McDonald's sign here and said, what do you think, column A or B? You obviously go with the column B one. My kids have never had any McDonald's. People are usually amazed by that. But they don't have that. They've never had Burger King. They've never had Taco Bell, Wendy's. None of that stuff. Um, Nor you know, my granddaughter. Awesome. Ever. Yeah. They've never, they, they stepped foot inside. My son stepped foot inside a McDonald's once because it was a big jungle gym and he was, I don't know, he's like 18 months old. So I let him crawl around. Mm -hmm. And then we just, we ran out. Yeah, we were afraid. I'm just kidding. I wonder what would happen if they ate. They would think it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Awful. The first time my son tried soda, um, he's like, this is spicy. I don't like this. You know, just get away from it. He doesn't want it anymore. So he doesn't, you know, I mean, how, how great is that <laughs> to not want those types of things? So, you know, we don't introduce it into their lives. Therefore, they don't even know what it tastes like. And actually, they know what real food tastes like. So when they taste the artificial stuff, it's just, blah, it's, it's so much different. So they're loaded with something called trans fats. Trans fats is one of the three worst things you could possibly put in your body. The first one that was on that Tuesday Talks list is called the three worst foods to eat and why. Trans fats is one of them. You definitely want to educate yourselves on what those are and why you should stay away from them. And what can I eat? <laughs> it's very simple. Real food. All right? Real food is what you want to eat. So here are some of the things that we eat in our house. And these are the ones that are listed under the healthy meal options in that as well. So you want to start off your breakfast with a veggie omelet. You can use onions, tomatoes, and avocado. We, we like a slice of raisin sunflower bread with olive oil and cinnamon dusted on that, as opposed to butter. Yes, butter is definitely better than margarine. Olive oil is better than butter. Um, and I would certainly go with a, an organic type of butter with regards to that, as opposed to a regular one, because it concentrates some of the potential toxins in a non-organic. Organic steel cut oats with shredded coconut and blueberries. Coconut's got a lot of great uh, fats in there. Fats are good. You want really good fats in your diet because every cell in your body is made up of fat. So you want to replace that with good fats, not the bad fats. Yeah, I have a question. I eat much. And yes, kids like it. <laughs> My kids love eating that stuff. Grilled cheese, the adult mm. version. Uh, herb, goat cheese, and mozzarella cheese with a pesto. We put baby spinach and avocado, and we use a hearty flaxseed bread. The breads we use are Heidelberg bread. I've just found that their ingredients are just much higher quality than your average breads that are even local around the area, as well as the other ones. Uh, you can get them at most of the Wise markets now. So you could just go in there, and they have a whole section. They have about seven or eight different options for them. Heidelberg. Okay. Yeah. Price Chopper has it, too. Okay. Price Chopper has it, and so does the Down to Earth store. Yep, mm -hmm. Down to Earth well. for has all those breads, all yep. of them. Yeah. yeah, that's actually listed on the healthy meals on the website. This this uh, meal is on there, and then in there there's a link to Heidelberg. You can learn about it. 
I mean, you can also have a link to Healthy, which is on there as well. And Down to Earth Store in India. Down to Earth as well, mm -hmm. yep. Broiled wild caught, I'd recommend wild caught fish as opposed to farm raised. Anytime we, we try and capture the natural animals out there and try and grow them ourselves, we mess things up. So just get it out there in nature as best you can. So wild caught haddock, salt, pepper, garlic, paprika, lemon, and white wine. It's all in how you flavor it. Fish is really, can be very delicious. Most of it's not very fishy unless you start getting into like salmon and things like that. But Haddock, it's a great fish. We serve it with sweet potatoes and broccoli. And yes, kids like it. If you feed it to them, and you flavor it, and you let them know how delicious it is, they're going to like it. Yeah, Maria. Yeah, how come I don't like sweet potatoes like mashed up, but I like sweet potato fries? I can't answer that question. For you. <laughs> is there any way I can make that. sweet potatoes? I like it because I like it in some forms. Make the fries yourself. Yeah. There's, there's also, yeah, you can certainly yeah. make fries like that. Um, there's, I mean, Check out the web for different ways to, to prepare sweet potatoes. Uh, teriyaki marinated in a porterhouse with a balsamic glade Brussels sprouts. Super easy. Just put them in a bag, shake them around with some uh, some balsamic vinegar, a little bit of oil. Dump them on your, your, your pan and bake them for about 20 minutes. Flip them over, bake them for another 10 minutes, and that's it. They're fabulous. My mother-in-law tried them uh, on Sunday for Mother's Day. She was over. She goes, I don't like, I don't like uh, Brussels sprouts. I said, well, just try, you know, treating her like my child. Just try one, you know, have one. If you don't like it, you don't have to have the rest of it. So she tries one, she goes, wow, that's really good. And so she ended up having a half a plateful. So just experiment with things. Uh, black beans, there's your legumes, some red peppers, there's some of the rainbows and the colors. Uh, we use a little bit of corn in that, some lime juice, uh, onions, and I think there was garlic in there, with garlic wedges in there as well. So Which, what oil should you cook with? Because I heard you're not supposed to cook with olive oil. Uh, I told you that you don't want to high cook with olive oil. Saute low to medium. That's fine. Once you high cook and fry things, you want to use coconut oil. Okay. So where to begin? Can't do it all in one shot. If you do, you're going to fail. Sorry, but you will. But if you totally revamp everything. So start slowly. Start by eliminating something. If it's soda, that's a good one. Get it out of there. Maybe it's, well, you can't eliminate sugar out of everything, so don't try that one. But maybe adding sugar, eliminate that one. Or maybe fried foods or whatever. You choose. I'm not going to choose it for you. But you've got to come up with it yourself. You want to introduce slowly as well. Introduce one thing. If you did absolutely nothing different over the next 12 months, but you just had a serving, one serving, one cup of vegetables every single day for the next 365 days, do you think you'd be healthier at the end of the year? Yeah, of course. And that's just making one little change. You're obviously going to make one change, and then you can make another change, and then another change. So just simply adding something and not taking away anything out of your horrible diets. I'm just kidding. I don't think everybody has a horrible diet. But if you just add something good, that can radically change your health in just one year. Experiment with different seafood and lean meats. Wegmans has a ton of different fruits and vegetables out there. When you're going through it, let's say once a week, just challenge yourself to take something that you've never tried before. They got some really weird looking fruits out there. You know, unique fruit, star fruit, ugly fruit. There's a fruit called ugly fruit, and it is ugly. But try it. It's actually quite tasty. So just experiment with it. If you don't like it, you just bought one. But if you like it, wow, now you could add something else to your rainbow colors. Allow yourself to cheat. Pick a couple of days to start, Wednesdays and Sundays, you know? Go three days and say, oh, I gotta have that soda, or oh, I gotta have that whatever. But allow yourself to cheat, because if you don't, and you fail that one time, you're gonna say, I give up, I can't do it, because it's too hard. So make it easy, the transition in the beginning. Number two, exercise. No brainer. Nutrition and exercise, most people know about it. It can increase your energy levels, lower your stress, you could read that whole thing if you want. I actually put it on a put it on a, uh, a a handout for you. But there's a whole bunch of things. I think if you could if you could think of some function in the human body, there's a study done that says exercise can help. Do we really need any more studies to tell us that exercise is beneficial to your overall health? No, <clears throat> definitely not. You know. So these are a whole bunch of things that you can do, or that that can help out with. So there's essentially three types of exercise. And if you ask my wife Shauna. She will say, I exercise, I do laundry, I vacuum, 
and I chase the kids around. It all counts. It all counts. <laughs> so, you know, I go with this one here. The laundry one, you know, uh, there's a little bit of weightlifting there, but the vacuuming, okay, you're getting some movement. Chasing the kids around, if you're really running around after them, you know, my kids are getting older, they're getting harder to catch. So if they really run around, whew, I could build up a little bit of a, a heartbeat going on there. So, but they really don't count for true solid exercise. All right, I'm not saying it's bad, and you you know definitely get some movement there. It's better than sitting on a couch, but you really need to get your body moving and challenge it in order to really make some gains and growth. So the real three types of exercise are flexibility, aerobic, and anaerobic. Flexibility. All right, so you can do stretches and things like that. There's a lot of different ways to increase your flexibility, but you don't want to be like this guy right here. <laughs> Remember him? You know, click, 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 click. You got to loosen up those joints. All right, so you don't want to be like Tin Man, but you also don't need to be like crazy flexible guy. So try and find a balance somewhere in between those two. And you can do that by, again, simply just starting to do some stretches. Anytime you do a stretch, whether it's your neck, your shoulder, your low back, your chest, or whatever, you're always going to want to hold those stretches for a good 30 seconds or more. Okay, I'm ready. No, that does nothing. You move the joint, maybe, but there's no way you did any increase in flexibility to the muscle. Long, sustained, solid hold, 30 seconds, move on to the next stretch. If you want to know some stretches to do, you can Google it on the website. There's probably 10,246,986 different exercise routines you could do for stretching. You want to increase your neck, you want to increase your lower spine, your shoulders, your chest. I can't stand up here and go through all of those stretches. You can go to my website. On the bottom, there's the exercise videos. Pick and choose your body that you want to do and just get out there and start doing it. Two to five minutes of stretching per day will do your body wonders. You want to get involved in a bit more of a class to walk you through it? Yoga and Pilates, they're great. They're going to increase your flexibility, but also increase your overall core strength for those things as well. So you choose how you want to do it, but try and incorporate some flexibility on somewhat of a regular basis. Aerobic is basically anything that you, requires more oxygen to make you get through it. So. Walking, people say, oh, walking, that's, you know, that's my exercise. Okay, but you got to walk briskly. Walking with your hands in your pocket, talking to the person next to you, laughing, giggling, and carrying on a conversation, not really true exercise. I know they say that, you don't want to push it, you know, you want to be able to have a conversation. Not really. All right? You want to be able to maybe get two or three sentences out and go, oh, hold on a second. You know, catch your breath a little bit, and then continue to talk like that. But you don't have to push yourself to look like this guy. <laughs> Find that balance in between somewhere. Don't overexert. My father would always say, all right, but how much is too much? No one can answer that question. Too much is when you blow out your, your, your muscle. I don't know, you know. But how do you really know when to get there? I do know that you have to push yourself a little bit to make any gains. That's, a, that's for sure. So you can do things like bicycling, swimming, brisk walking, jogging, running, tennis, Skipping rope. When's the last time you skip rope? Whew, I could probably do like 15 or so and then my calves are burning, I'm, I'm, I'm passing out. That's a really incredible aerobic type exercise. Um, trampoline, just basically for running in place, for jogging, it's easier on the joints, things like that. Uh, dancing, aerobic classes, Zumba is becoming much, much more popular these days. Lots of different options out there. It's not for me to say, hey, Chuck, you got to start doing some more dancing. I think Carol might like that. <laughs> Anaerobic are basically things that don't require a uh, sudden urge in, in oxygen. Um, you can get away with, with uh, not increasing your, your heart rate to get through them. So, weightlifting, that probably wouldn't count. You know, you're not really stressing your body too much. But you certainly don't have to look like oh this guy. Goodness. I don't even know if that's real, but I think it is. That's just insane. So. Find that, no, that's totally natural. <laughs> Find that natural balance. Lifting helium balloons isn't going to do it, but lifting 300 pounds in one arm might be a little too stressful for you. So I'll get the picture up pretty soon. It's a little, it's a little obnoxious.
So anyways, weight training. You can use free weights, machines, or TheraBands. Lots of different options out there. You can use an exercise ball. You could just use your own body weight. You could do something called plyometrics. Whatever it is, but try and get out there and do some type of resistive type exercise where you're challenging some of your muscles to work. I'll take the picture off. It's okay. <laughs> so Dr. Doug's only rule. I only got one for this one particular topic. Make it count fun. <laughs> and make it count. But you gotta make it fun. You know, I could tell you that I love to go out jogging. I don't. But if I did, that's something that I, that I really enjoy doing and, and I like doing it. But if someone really despises jogging, but they said, oh, they, yeah, I heard it was good, you'll probably do it for a week or two and then you'll give up on it because it's just so painful to go through that motion of doing it. So maybe you like riding a bike, get out there on the bike. Maybe you like kayaking or swimming or whatever. Choose something that you enjoy because if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to stick to it. Okay? I do something called P90X. P90X, you've probably seen it on the infomercials, is actually a great balance of flexibility, aerobic, and anaerobic type activities. Each day they give you a different type of exercise and in a few weeks they switch it up and give you different types of exercises. So it's constantly changing and challenging your body. You can do it at a high intensity level, medium, low, whatever you want. Find a program that works well for you and just get into it and enjoy it. Number three, what's a great way to improve memory, live longer, reduce inflammation, spur creativity, sharpen your attention, maintain weight, lower stress, avoid depression, and strengthen your immune system? Almost. What? Sleep and sleep. Drink water. Sleep and read. Bingo. Sleep. And some people go to sleep because they try. So sleep, yeah. Sleep is where your body rebuilds and rejuvenates itself. So you can eat all the right things and you can exercise an hour and a half. Uh, per day, but if you're not getting any rest and you're only sleeping for three or four hours, your body's breaking itself down through that exercise and it's not able to build and repair itself. So you really have to find a good balance of all these different five pillars that we're talking about. So, and I'm not talking about this kind of sleep. <laughs> that one doesn't count. Just like walking casually doesn't count for exercise. This guy obviously needs more sleep. Sleeping on the job. We don't like that. She doesn't sleep on <laughs> So you want something like this. Oh, uh, that's what I said when I first thought. You know, you want to sleep like a baby. You know, minus the whole crying and peeing and pooping in your pants type thing. You know, but really get in there and get that deep baby-like sleep. Not the greatest posture. I wouldn't recommend belly sleeping with your head twisted off to the side. But you want to get some deep REM-like sleep. We have a handout called 33 Secrets to a Good Night's Sleep. If anybody really needs to read through those, let us know. We'll just print off some. That's no problem. I'm going to go through about a half a dozen of those right here, and those are the ones that are on your handouts. Uh, but there's a bunch of different ones. Don't do them all, because it'll take you all night. You'll never get any rest, so you don't want to do that one. But pick and choose a few. So first thing, you want to sleep in complete darkness. Now get yourself some room darkening shades or something, but there's something about light that interrupts your... Um, circadian rhythms and it interrupts the pineal glands production of something called melatonin and serotonin. So some people have heard of melatonin, you know, you take a supplement for melatonin, it can help you sleep better. Okay, yeah, because that's one of the, one of the hormones that can help get you into your deep REM sleep. There's also something called valerian root, you can start taking some of that as well. I would urge you all to really try and, even though they're natural products, I still always want you to, you know, just rely upon your own body and, and figure out why. So I wouldn't point you down the path of going supplement route right off the bat, but I'd try some of these other ones instead. Don't use a nightlight. How long have you been living in your house? You kind of know where the furniture is? You know where the bathroom is? Okay, so unplug the nightlight. Some people get a little anxiety. Okay, you know, if that's, if that's the issue, then maybe try and, uh, you know, put something in front of the light so that it's not beaming right at you and maybe it's more of a background glow. Use different colors. There's red ones, there's white ones, there's green ones. Red, believe it or not, seems to be the more soothing color for most people for night. I don't know why. I would think red is blaring emergency. But whatever it is, the studies show that red seems to be better. On your alarm clock, if you have a red one versus a green one, they say that those with red alarm clocks tend to sleep deeper. I would suggest taking your alarm clock and turning it on an angle so if you want to see the time, you can still see it, but the light actually shines more out that way. I've tried it, and it makes a big difference when I'm trying to fall asleep. Um, 
close the bathroom in case you have a window or something in your bathroom. That's more in the lines of waking you up in the morning, not necessarily helping you get to sleep at night. Keep electrical devices out of the bedroom. Some people are really super sensitive to different electrical fields. So your television, your computer, your cell phones. Do we need to be connected 24 hours a day? No. So literally, out of the bedroom is the best. Even if they're plugged in, there's still some electromagnetic fields going on in there. If you want to test it out, but you don't want to move the television, unplug it, leave it in there, but at least it's disconnected and there's no electrical fields in there, and get your phones and your computer, your laptops out of there. See what happens. See if that helps you out with regards to your sleep. Establish a bedtime routine. This is what we do with my kids, so basically. <laughs> we wash them, we read to them. Sometimes you might have a vaporizer or something like that. We say our prayers. If you don't say your prayers, start saying your prayers. You just say prayers. Go to bathroom. Definitely go to the bathroom before you go to bed, okay? Because you don't want to wake up three, four times throughout the night. Uh, and then go to sleep. And do that each night. Again, this is for people that are really having some challenges sleeping. If it's a once in a while thing, okay, you might want to try something else. But just get into a routine. And then try and keep the bedtime the same. The earlier the better. I used to say six to eight hours of sleep is really what you want. I really say eight plus now. Because I just know that six is really not enough for most of what people do. And you can get those hours. You just have to pick and choose what you need to do. Some people say they can. Avoid food and drink two hours before bedtime. It's kind of a no-brainer. But really try and stay away from carbs in your dinners and eat more of a higher protein. It's just going to aid in digestion. It's a slower digestion and actually helps put you down a bit more. Journaling. A lot of people try this and get great results. There's something about just taking that information out of your brain temporarily, jotting it down on a book, not a whole, you know, three pages, but just a couple ideas, boom, 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 whatever's in your mind, close it, stick it away, and that just alleviates so much mental stress and strain that people have going throughout the day, it just allows their brains to finally shut down for a little bit. Read something spiritual or religious, not a suspense novel. You know, I got into the whole Harry Potter series, and I was kind of reading through those things, and man, you know, I, I, I'd be like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read a little bit. Kids are asleep, I'm going to read a little bit. And I was like, midnight, what are you kidding? One more chapter, one more chapter. You know, what's going to happen next? So it'll work against you if you start reading suspense type stuff. So just read something more calming and relaxing. Wear warm socks to bed. People with circulation issues. That's a really simple one to do. Um, I've never done it, but some people find great success with it. How simple is that? Just put a pair of socks on, it might solve your sleeping issues. I don't know. Melatonin or valerian root supplements. We kind of touched base a little bit on that before. I put it last because I want you to try it last. I want you to try some of these other uh, natural things first. And I've taken valerian root for years and it does work. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When you open it up, how's it smell? Not too good. It smells like socks, only dirty ones. <laughs> yeah, it's got a very good smelling yeah. herb, I'll tell you that. Maybe that's why people pass out from the smell. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it's a powerful I don't herb. take it regularly, only once in a while. And um, But it does have an awful smell. And, yeah, if it doesn't um, smell, chances are it's not a good quality. It, and it works. And it's something that you want to take where it says take one, mm -hmm. don't take four. Don't say more is better. Test it, Just test it out. More. Yep, start with one. If that didn't seem like enough, the next night or the next time you want to try it, maybe try two it's or really something good. Like that yeah. Number four, PMA. Anybody know what that stands for? Postmortem. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Wrong talk, John. Wrong talk. Postmortem. Positive mental attitude. This is. <laughs> I know she'll think. I was thinking menopause. <laughs> Most people, when I say the PM, usually people just leave off the other one and, they, and you know, they go down that road. But positive mental attitude, and that really incorporates a whole lot of things. Uh, basically, it's anything mental. Anything uh, mental stress, things of that nature. That's what we're talking about. How do you view the world? When I take a look at this picture, what do I see? What do you see? Good, that's a really good thing to see. I see weeds. I see dandelions. You know? And what do, when I see dandelions, what's the first thing I'm thinking of? The dandelion monster. You know, I gotta, I gotta get this guy, because this guy's gonna get me. 
You know, some people think this. They almost, they, without even being exposed to it, you can actually, there's studies where they show you pictures of pollen and they start breaking out in, in allergy-like symptoms. Not even being exposed to the actual thing, but just meant seeing a picture of it. That's how powerful your mind can be. It can play all sorts of tricks. You can think yourself sick, you can think yourself well. It's all in how you perceive it. Are you like me, where you just got you kill it? You got to launch an all-out aerial attack on that? Thing? Get rid of every single one? Glass half full. Glass, Glass empty. Full. You got it. Yeah. Or you like, these aren't my kids, but my kids love dandelions. You know? <laughs> Do you look at it as an opportunity to be a princess with a crown? As opposed to something bad? Well, they are pretty. They're, they're yellow. They beautiful. certainly can be. I still don't like them. I mean, the colors are so pretty. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, does does my daughter view it as a as an opportunity to pick a bouquet for my wife? Absolutely. You know, she comes in here, mommy. You know, there's a little there's little purple weeds too that we got. She's pulling those out. So now we got purple and yellow, two of my wife's favorite colors. So she really knows how to play her heart. So you know, do you look at it as that, or do you look at it as an opportunity to spend hours with your friends or your brother or your sister? Blowing that stuff in each other's faces. <laughs> Ugh, if it blew it in my face, I'd start breaking out and sneezing and whatever. I don't really have any allergies. But you know, I asked my daughter, well, what do you think of when you blow that thing? She's like, I think it's like snowflakes just blowing all over. And I said, well, you know, judging by yesterday, it's a possibility that it really was snowflakes. <laughs> but my son thinks it's little angels that are being released into the air to go, you know, solve all of us problems or something. So beautiful mindset as opposed to I gotta kill, I gotta destroy. So what do you see when you see this? Mm. Gloomy. Yeah. I can't go out. It's rainy. I don't want to get wet. What do kids see? Opportunity to go out and play, have some fun. It's different. Get wet out there. It's my opportunity to be a pirate. So you know, put on your pirate gear and jump out there. You know. Pretend you're on a pirate ship and now splash around in the. They call the dragon. I'm sure somebody would. If I was red, if I was doing something like that, perhaps. So we did a talk a couple of months ago called "21 Days to a Happier You," and it was an idea that I got from this guy named Sean Acker, um, and it's a, it was a really awesome video. For those of you that saw it, I'm sure you enjoyed at least the video portion of it. But he goes through a 21 day <coughs> program to really retrain your brain to scan the world for the more positive. And if you did the 21 days, I guarantee you, you would have a different outlook. You might not see the deadly weeds, you might see the, the princess crown. All right. I don't know, but it can certainly yeah, change the way you I have you, a question about that exercise, because I've been mm -hmm. trying to do it. Um, what's a good time to do the gratitude as it comes through the day, or the end of the day, or the beginning of the day? Or as long as you do the three gratitudes throughout the day. If you have the opportunity to, to give those gratitudes face to face to somebody, Take it. Okay. If you don't, then email it something, somehow get that gratitude out there. Okay. So I would encourage you to go back to the Tuesday talks and actually see that thing, because it really was it really was a pretty fun talk that we did. I had a lot of fun doing it. Abraham Lincoln, if you look for the bad in people expecting to find it, you surely will. Absolutely. How many people do you know that when they come into the room you're like, uh <laughs> There comes Mike again. He's going to complain about his fill in the blank. You know, and Mike might tell you 72 really good things, but then he might actually mention that his shoes are too tight. I don't know. And you're like, oh, you see? Bill always complains his shoes are too tight. Ugh. If you find the negative, if you look for it, you're definitely going to find it and miss out on the 72 positive things that they could potentially offer you. I love that quote. How do you view yourself? What words do you use when you talk to yourself? Are they positive or are they negative? Would you be your friend if your friend talked to you the way you talk to yourself? I'm so clumsy. Oh, that was so stupid. I'm so dumb. You know, oh, I can't stay. I gotta lose weight. I'm so fat. You know, how many times do you? And maybe you don't, but a lot of people do. They have this self-talk that really just drives you down. You gotta get away from that. Can this impact your health? Absolutely. You could think yourself well, you could think yourself sick. It just depends on how you choose to think. The frozen water study. Maybe some of you know this one, maybe you don't, but it's a really cool study. 
and we're going to see a three minute video in just a second. But Dr. Masaru Emoto, I think I got his name right. So he froze water at negative 25 degrees Celsius. He sliced this water real thin and he stuck it underneath an electron microscope and he looked at what the crystal structure was. And he took all sorts of different types of water, natural water, um, he took ones from polluted areas, he took ones that were prayed over. He, so he took, he took a baseline of what that water looked like. Some were neutral. And then he exposed it to different types of music. And then he exposed it to different words, both spoken as well as written, wrote it, taped it to the jar. And then he also, people surrounded it and thought different words and sayings and also prayed over it. And the findings they found were actually quite remarkable. So I'm just going to show you a three minute video just to kind of take a look and see for yourself. Choose, make, make your own conclusion on it. of the newborn's body is actually water, and about 50% of an elderly person is, is water. So, you know, hydrate, 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 keep yourself hydrated. Um, if you have all those negative thoughts going through your brain about yourself, what are you doing to the water molecules that are inside your body? 
You know, it's just like eating those trans fats versus the good fats. Garbage in, garbage out. So if you think a lot of negative thoughts and beat yourself up all the time, I don't know what's going on with the cells inside your body, but according to a study like this, I don't know, maybe it's really detrimental to your health. Don't we think more, uh, more negative thoughts anyway always than positive? Just that on the normal. However you train it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. On the And most people think 100% negative. Well, we all know those people. Yeah, thank God. Yeah. So your brain and your muscles are about 75% water. Your blood and your kidneys are comprised of about 81%, and then your liver is about 71% water. Why do older people water. have less water? I don't exactly know why. That's just how the studies came out. Number five is a properly functioning nervous system. There's a saying in chiropractic that we that we one of our one of our core principles is, is the the power that made the body heals the body. And I'm gonna show you a quick little video on this one as well. But I love this this uh, this phrase because it really makes sense as to why we can help out with so many different things. So I'm gonna take you back to biology class for a moment. For the winner? The journey continues. It sheds its now useless tail and releases its treasure. Manu's genes merge with Barbara's. Of this union, one cell will be born. A single, unique cell. The fruit of desire, the blueprint of a life. An egg. At this moment, almost everything is laid down. Then the process accelerates. A new life begins to take shape. The egg instantly divides into two cells, then four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two cells, all of them identical. On the third day of its expedition, the egg dives into an immense grotto that it will soon call home. The uterus. On the sixth day, the egg leaves its shell and settles on the wall of this hospitable refuge. The egg starts by developing connections with its environment. These will make up the future placenta, a platform for permanent exchanges with Barbara's body. Simultaneously, a disc begins to form in the center. The egg changes into an embryo. At 14 days, it is still smaller than a pin egg. A few days later, the embryo has grown considerably. It now rests in the middle of two pockets full of liquid, and it goes through an amazing series of transformations. They begin with the formation of the nervous system. A trough forms on its back. Then, like a seam, it closes along its length and becomes a tube. This is the future spinal cord, and these two giant protuberances are the future hemispheres of the brain. During this time, the embryo was curled up. A rudimentary heart is slowly forming. Blood vessels begin to appear, and the circulatory system takes shape. strangely resembles a fish, then, a little later, an amphibian, and finally a reptile. All this is in the natural order of things. The evolving human embryo goes through all the stages of the evolution of the species. It even has a tail, which it will soon lose. In less than four weeks, the egg evolves from a single cell to several million perfectly organized cells. For this tiny organism is its own brilliant architect. So, I show that video. Any idea why? Anyone? No, spinal cord. Yeah. The very first system that's created when each and every single one of us was created in mom's womb is your is your spinal cord your nervous system 
that you know the cells divide, 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 and then the first structure that happens is they fold over, and you become a spinal cord, and then at the top it becomes two hemispheres for the brain, and the reason why is because your nervous system, that's the master controller, that's that runs the show. I mean, if you don't have a connection between your brain and your body, that's it, you're done. I mean, you can go for a long time without something to eat. You could go for days without something to drink. You can go for minutes sometimes without a breath of air, but you can't go a split second without nerve supply. You just can't do it. So the power that made the body heals the body. That's, that's what the phraseology is. And what that means is your nervous system was the first system to be born, so to speak, because from that spinal cord you have these little twigs that come off. And then the brain's job is to tell the cells that are around here to start creating heart cells. And then the cardiovascular system is grown, which is what you kind of saw there. Then you start building lungs, then a stomach, then skin, then hair, then eyes, then nose, teeth, whatever. But it all starts with that nervous system. And that's why it's so critically important, and that's why it's one of the five pillars of health, because you really want to take care of that nervous system. A lot of people don't think about it. They just sort of take it for granted. So as a chiropractor, my focus is on the nervous system, not the back. I'm not a bad back doc, but I'm a nervous system guy. Everything, the other four pillars that you just heard about, they all can adversely or positively affect the way your nervous system functions. So that's why there are all these five different ones. So your brain sits inside your head and Every single day, it sends millions and trillions, billions, I think I went out of order there, but trillions and trillions of nerve messages down that spine to all your different body parts telling them what to do. It tells your heart to beat, your lungs to breathe, your muscles to move, whatever. If you have misalignments in the spine or you adversely affect the way that nervous system functions, it could take those, that nerve impulse and fire it down to just a trickle. So now you don't have full nerve supply going to your body, and that could be pretty bad for you. It could cause all sorts of things. So as the chiropractor, me, or any chiropractor, we come in here and we really try and locate, are there any areas that are causing some of this neurological stress? And if it is, we, we give it the big term, the subluxation. That's the big word. So we look to minimize and eventually extinguish these subluxations. And it's not all just with alignment of the spine, although that's a huge part of it. But the things you eat, like trans fats, can adversely affect it. Sugar can adversely affect it. Toxins in the environment can adversely affect some of these things. Your thoughts, your emotions can adversely affect it. When you are really stressed out, your heart rate goes up, you might breathe a little bit, you get some anxiety, all because of your mentality. So there's proof right there that what you think affects your physiology. And it does that by affecting the nervous system. So there's a strong communication, strong connection. <coughs> So people think of pinched nerve pain. Most people do. And that happens at about 10% of the time because 10% of your nervous system is a sensory nerve. So if you pinch a sensory nerve, it can cause pain, numbness, tingling, hot, cold, whatever. But there's two other systems, your motor nerves and your autonomic, that have nothing to do with symptoms whatsoever. So if you pinch a motor nerve, that controls your muscles. You won't feel pain, but you might have things like weakness or spasm, tightness, fatigue. <coughs> Exhaustion. <coughs> if you pinch an autonomic nerve, autonomic nerves control things like your blood vessels, your organs, and your glands. So your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys. If you pinch an autonomic nerve, you don't feel it because it's not sensory, but it can cause things like sinus and allergy problems out there. It can cause low energy levels, digestive issues, breathing issues, whatever, because it's that nervous system that's controlling it. In our office, you know, there's no way to say, hey, and how's that pancreas you just doing today? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I can't feel it. But obviously it's working, because if it wasn't, you wouldn't be alive. So we do different scans that tell us how the motor and the nervous system's doing, because you can't give me that feedback. So we do what's called a rolling thermal scan, which measures temperature in the blood vessels surrounding the spine. If it's fairly balanced, it comes out with lots of white bars. That's good and healthy. If it starts to get some colors, it indicates that, huh, there's some levels of stress or strain there. We're going to want to take a closer look and see what's going on. Maybe it's an alignment issue. Maybe it's something you're eating. Maybe it's something you're thinking. I don't know. 
when I know that the nervous system's not working like it's supposed to. The EMG is for the motor nerves, the muscles. So for you to sit up fairly straight, it should be pretty easy to do. You shouldn't have to work hard at standing up straight. But if you do, and you have to work harder on one side versus the other, that gives us an idea there's some sort of shift or imbalance in there. So we're going to want to take a little closer look at that as well. Posture, we say posture is the window to the spine. Because if you have good posture, ideally, things should be fairly well aligned. It's not always the case. I come in and I see people that look really good, but then I take an x-ray and they're all twisted and turned to get here. They look great on the outside, but inside they're a train wreck. So it's not the only thing. But you take enough pieces of the puzzle and you paint yourself a pretty good picture. With posture, you'll want to see level shoulders, level hips, level knees, ankles, and eyes. You also want to see this thing go straight down in between the knees and so forth. From the side, ankle, knee, hip, shoulder, and ear should pretty much line up along the line. This guy, not too straight. Not too bad from here to here. But obviously you see his shoulder tipping up and his head is totally off that midline. So he's really kind of shifting off to the side like this. Usually the head's going to tilt a bit and the shoulder's going to go up as well. From the side, his hip is a little forward, but look at that head, boy. Woo! Most classic finding we find in almost everybody. Texting, kids on video games these days, sitting in recliner chairs, looking down, reading typing, whatever. We're a society that we look down all the time. So that's a really common finding, unfortunately. And you never know exactly if that's exactly what's going on. So what do you do? You take some pictures. So we want to see a nice straight spine from behind, which this one isn't. And from the side, we'd like to see a nice smooth curve like that, which it isn't. So this person has some issues going on. So we want to get in there and try and prevent some problems from happening in the future. Here's what you might see. You know, cute little kids, you know, young love, it's budding, He's give them a bouquet of flowers. Here's what I see. I see a low shoulder, his hips are uneven, he's got knee knock, you know, his foot's turning in. This kid's a mess. He's probably only five or six years old. So, he'd want to be checked for. So here's what you want to kind of look for on yourself. Again, posture doesn't give us all the information, but at least you can kind of look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh wow, you know. Dr. Sullivan said something about my shoulders, and those don't all look that good. So you want to take a look at the shoulder. Shoulder is the one thing that stands out to most people. Second thing is usually a head tilt, something along those lines. Another one you want to look for is this. If one arm's sort of swinging, hanging out, and the other one's resting against the side, it's usually because you're shifted off to the side, one way or the other. Pretty easy one to look for. Forward head translation, just have somebody look at you. Look at the ear to the shoulder. It should be back up and on top, ideally. Some people, how many times do you do this? <laughs> people's belt just keeps going off to the side. Check out people's belts. Look at your own if you got them on. But usually if that belt is kind of cranked off to the side, you're either taking a larger step with one and a smaller, and that's going to kind of give you an idea that there might be some pelvic shifting going on. Because each step is just going to slowly crank that little belt off to the side. My kids always have to kind of... No, they're actually perfectly aligned. I'm just kidding. So short sides, uh, what did I say? Short sides always down on one side. <coughs> you know, it's kind of like this. You'll see people, I see them all the time in my office, and I go to check posture. I always see the shirt kind of tilted off to the side. Or you know, I can only hold my purse on one shoulder versus the other. If I put it on this one, it falls off my arm all the time. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, I know why, because you're like this. You're like a ski slope off to the side. You just slide down there each time. So maybe that's an indicator for you. Uneven shoe wear, the bottom of the heels. Just take a look at your shoes that you've had for about six months or so. Look at the bottoms of them. You want to see even heel wear uh, between the left side and the right side comparing the shoes. Right? If one side's really worn down, you might actually have an anatomically short leg. You might be walking a bit funny. Something's going on. It's not biomechanically correct. Uneven range of motion, lateral flexion or rotation. Just take yourself through it. Okay, I can go that way, look in the mirror. You can go. Is that all I could do? Wow. No. Go one way, eh, not the other. Turn your head one way, note how far you're turning. Turn it the other way. Maybe you're not going as far. Maybe you're going really far. Check yourself. Ideally, things should be even and balanced. If it's not, something might be going on there. Right? Do you think, like, with that next exercise, besides making you look good, but could you, um, could you change your posture and make you 
healthier that way. I do a lot. Exercise. With the next exercise. Absolutely, that's why I give it to you. Oh. <laughs> the more out of alignment and stressed out you are on that spine, the more you're going to potentially stress out the spinal cord, which is the nervous system. That you don't want to do. Posture, ideal position, is where you want to come as close as you can to. Not just to look good, but to function good. Yeah. And when the spine is stressed out, it causes a certain degree of inflammation, which can affect all the meridians in your body from the top of your head to your toes, right? From the nose to the toes. So that's why we should go to a chiropractor and get, get all these tests done to find out what we can do to mm -hmm. feel where's better. Your, where's your starting point? Yeah. And, and periodic yeah. rescans and checks to see how you're coming along. Pants need tailoring because one side is longer than the other or the bottoms of your, if you don't tailor your pants, you notice that one, the cuffs on one leg just always seem to be kind of tearing up and ratty versus the other. That could indicate a leg length issue or a pelvic imbalance. One side drops more than the other. So, some closing thoughts. <coughs> you know, we talked about the five pillars. It was nutrition. It was exercise. It was sleep. It was positive mental attitude. And what ties it all together, in my opinion, is obviously the nervous system because, again, that's, that's what I'm about. That's what I do. That's why I do all these talks. Every single talk we do is geared toward maximizing your nervous system's health to overall influence your whole body health. Right? That's the focus. So your takeaway is not to do everything that we talked about here. You've got to start slow. You've got to start somewhere. But you want to start incorporating, even if it's just one or two things. In 365 days from now, you're going to be healthier as a result of just making some small changes. You'd be a lot healthier if you made some significant changes, but at least start making some types of, of changes within.